Chinese regime is threatening to arrest U.S. nationals in China as a form of retaliation to the Justice Department's prosecution of scholars affiliated with the Chinese military. Also, a new U.S. government report details how the Chinese regime uses overseas students and scholars to feed its government programs. I'll be going in-depth into this. And also, the founding stories of the United States have been changed, and they're now focused instead on slavery and racism. But a new documentary is talking about the more traditional view of American history. We'll be talking with actor Nick Searcy about this. Welcome back, everyone. First off, the Chinese regime is threatening to arrest U.S. nationals in China as a form of retaliation to the Justice Department's prosecution of scholars affiliated with the Chinese military. This is according to an exclusive story by the Wall Street Journal, which cited unnamed sources allegedly familiar with the matter. Now, it reports that Chinese officials have repeatedly issued warnings to representatives of the United States government through multiple channels, including through the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. It says the CCP's message is that the United States should drop its prosecution of Chinese scholars or the CCP may start going after Americans in China. Now, again, what are we seeing? The Chinese Communist Party has done things like this in the past. You might remember Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou still facing extradition to the United States. Now she's being detained in Canada and facing again extradition to the U.S. to face charges. Now the Chinese regime in what has been framed as retaliation for her arrest has detained two different Canadians in China and is charging them with espionage. They're facing the death penalty. And the Chinese Communist Party has in the past said they would release those individuals, those Canadians, if the Canadian government lets go Meng Wanzhou. In other words, basically a prisoner exchange. The Chinese Communist Party is now threatening to do that to Americans. Because again, the United States is detaining these different Chinese agents, allegedly facing charges for being tied to the Chinese military or other branches of the CCP, on charges of, for example, stealing U.S. intellectual property, stealing U.S. research, and possibly bringing that back to China. And the Chinese Communist Party has in the past shown that when it does these tit-for-tat retaliations, it sometimes does so without real charges. They appear to be trumped-up charges. Now, a few things we can expect from this. This will likely deepen concerns over the CCP's possible enforcement of its national security laws overseas. You might remember a lot of different controversy around this. When the Chinese Communist Party effectively ended autonomy in Hong Kong, when it passed these new national security laws, part of that is a new policy where people in other countries could face extradition back to China if they violate the CCP's laws, including things as basic as opposing the Chinese Communist Party's rule over Hong Kong. If you say you support democracy in Hong Kong, allegedly under that law, you could face extradition back to China. And now, of course, this also means it's going to be higher risk for U.S. scholars, researchers, businessmen, investors operating in China. And it's ironic because most of these individuals, including journalists who are operating there, are already to an extent following the Chinese Communist Party's different regulations when it comes to self-censorship, when it comes to following the CCP's laws that allow you to stay in the country as it is. Meaning it's going after Americans who already have somewhat favorable views towards China. And it's going to marginalize these individuals very likely through this policy. Meanwhile, a U.S. government report details how the Chinese regime uses overseas students and scholars to feed its government programs and military development. Now, the findings are detailed in an October 7 report from the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, which says the leaders of China have, quote, long sought to harness the intellect of overseas Chinese students and scholars for the state's development and strategic priorities. And notes that over the last 30 years, quote, their efforts have become more systematic and sophisticated. Among the main targets in this push is expertise in science and technology, which it says is a task now viewed by CCP leaders as, quote, vital to regime survival. And given the importance that party leaders place on it, it says the CCP offers them, quote, powerful incentives to participate. In other words, these students and scholars are given powerful incentives to work on behalf of the CCP as they go abroad to study or research. It notes that CCP leader Xi Jinping has continued the trend set by former leaders by, quote, making clear that overseas Chinese students and scholars are key to its plans to transform China into an innovative and militarily formidable world power. 
It notes that as early as 2013, Xi Jinping said the system of Western leadership in the world was based on their degree of technological advancement, and that if the Chinese Communist Party is going to catch up with the West, it needs to use an asymmetrical strategy to do so. It notes that Xi identified key fields in technology that he said the West has a stranglehold over, and which it would be impossible for the CCP to catch up with by itself by 2050. And because the country, China, would be unable to, quote, catch up by itself, as he said, the focus has been on sending Chinese students to study abroad and establish dual research programs with Western institutions in order to steal technology or gain technological know-how by bringing it back to China. Now, in the language of the Chinese Communist Party, when they invite Western companies to China or when they have individuals from their own researchers go and do joint research programs with the West, what do they call that? They call that having a sparring partner. It means you're having, say, martial arts practice. It's war practice with an adversary. Sparring partners. Again, they're learning from what we do. They're learning from our businesses. And as soon as they no longer need them, they kick them out of China, they replace them on the international markets, or they steal the technology, bring it back to China, and never go back. The Chinese Communist Party has a bottom-up plan for technological development. This is different, if we go back to, say, the Cold War, for example, different from what the Soviet Union was doing. The Soviet Union had a top-down strategy. If, for example, they stole a type of U.S. technology, they would try to innovate it and copy it from the top, from exactly where it was. The problem is you're dealing with technological generations. There are generations in technology. Imagine, for example, getting an iPhone 12 and trying to research it as, you know, just trying to build an iPhone 12 off the top. It's very difficult. But if you already know how to develop, for example, the iPhone 10, jumping from 10 to 12 is not a huge jump. They can look at what's different in it, and they can work from the bottom up, learning to build, you know, the first few generations through normal means, then learning to build the next few generations by sending students abroad to study, then learning to build the next few ones through intellectual property theft. By the time they reach that, they have the technological know-how to build all that previous generation technology, and they can compete on the current generation using that strategy. That has been the approach of the Chinese Communist Party with these programs. Now, the report notes that many countries in the world have policies to try to entice skilled personnel to come back to their economies. But it says that no country in the world has science and technology transfer systems that are remotely comparable to China's in terms of scale, comprehensiveness, or determination to leverage its overseas nationals. It says the CCP's system, quote, exploits overseas Chinese students and scholars for knowledge in these fields that it sees as useful for its economy and for its military development. And these programs have a side effect as well of siphoning out of the United States the benefits of taxpayer-funded research and using it instead to advance its main strategic competitor. It notes that while some of the forms of transfer in this regard are legal, the Chinese government, quote, vigorously seeks to acquire such research precisely because it recognizes its strategic value. And the report also notes that it sees these as valuable since it gives China an advantage in its competition with the United States. And even when it comes to Chinese businesses getting contracts, there is often vague connections between public and private and between military and civil technologies in China. The CCP is able to nationalize private companies on a whim. And state structures and requirements also make it easy for the regime to use the knowledge of overseas students and scholars to advance the capabilities of its military. That's the People's Liberation Army or the PLA. The report says, quote, in effect, U.S. universities are training scientists and engineers who will work in a range of organizations antithetical to U.S. national security interests, including the PLA, again, the Chinese military. Now, while it's generally understood that the CCP has student spy organizations and also entices researchers and professors to spy on its behalf, the broader question of whether Chinese students overall pose a national security threat is something debated. The report notes that the number of Chinese students and research scholars in the United States went from around 68,000 in 2006 to around 370,000 in 2020. It notes that about 130,000 of those students and scholars are pursuing graduate degrees in science, engineering, and mathematics, STEM fields. While many of them are likely studying in the U.S. for honest reasons, the CCP uses programs to entice them, either to get them to act as spies, to steal information, or to return to China with the knowledge they gained from the U.S. 
The report notes that many science and technology programs for China, including for granting scholarships for students to study abroad, its systems to recruit talent, and its entrepreneurship parks, among others, quote, contribute to China's military civil fusion strategy by collecting specific technologies and know-how that improve the capabilities of the People's Liberation Army and advance the goals of the Chinese Communist Party. Now on these programs, the CCP has many different categories. There's direct control, things that the Chinese Student and Scholar Associations, things directly under, say, for example, the Chinese consulates, operated and funded by them. These are Chinese student groups run by the CCP, essentially. And the CCP can use them for many different purposes, whether it's monitoring other Chinese students at U.S. universities, and they operate openly. Whether it's, for example, holding cultural programs they can use to subvert the local communities, to get people to join them, to become friends with them, and to get deeper control over the influential elements of the society. The CCP has direct control programs like that. But it also has ones that are more, say, subtle, things that use overt systems that don't necessarily violate the law, or that might sometimes violate the law and sometimes not. Some of these, for example, ask people to return to China with the know-how they've gained, or to serve in place, basically learning on the ground until they've gained enough to either steal it or bring it back to China through their own knowledge. Among those programs are the Thousand Talents Program, the Torch Program, the 211 Program, the 973 Program, and many others. Now, folks, in some other news. The history of a country is what establishes how its people view its stories, their heritage, and the broader culture that forms a nation. Yet in the United States, its history is now under attack. The narrative is now shifting to one that frames the United States as being built on slavery. But many scholars argue this is a gross oversimplification that ignores the global environment in place over 400 years ago, and that also misrepresents the history of the country itself. Others interpret it through a religious perspective, noting the pilgrims who landed on Plymouth Rock came to this country with very different intentions, that being religious liberty, and that faith and belief have been the real driving force behind the American character. This history of the United States is shown in a new documentary, America, America, God Shed His Grace on Thee, which stars actor Nick Searcy. And to learn more about this, we've invited him to speak with us. Let's jump into that now. Hey, Nick Searcy, it's great having you on Crossroads. Oh, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. So we're in an interesting state in the United States where the story of our country is now being altered. There are people who are now painting it because of mainly New York Times 1619 project, painting the basis of America as being racism and slavery. And you've done this documentary just recently painting a very different history. You're arguing that America is built on faith. And so can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think the documentary that we made tries to, uh, to, to build the case or remind people of the, of the case that uh, the Bible was the inspiration for the Constitution. And that actually the reason America was settled in the first place, and the pilgrims came over here for religious liberty. They came over here so that they would be able to worship God in the way they wanted to without being controlled by the government of England. So th this idea that, that uh, America is a racist country and it was built on sin and slavery is, is a tactic used by the left to sort of demonize the entire country, the entire bold experiment of America, and to basically to make it easier to disassemble because what they're, what they're really trying to do is destroy the country and replace it with something else. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting take on it. You know, through my own research on this, I found something interesting, which is there were two very different revolutions that took place at the time of the American Revolution. Of course, we're going back to the Puritans now and the Pilgrims. But during the American Revolution, something interesting happened, which is two polar opposite revolutions are taking place in the world. There was the American Revolution and the French Revolution. The American Revolution was one that handed the power back to the people of the, of the country. It had faith in people's ability to make the right choices for themselves. And it was rooted in a belief in God, although it wasn't really specifically denominational. You know, they talked about, you know, created, you know, the creator, right? We're all created by God, this idea, but it stayed pretty open in terms of religious tolerance. In France, they had the opposite. They had the cult of reason, which was an atheist government system. 
And they preached this idea of reason in place of faith. And they also went back and tried to, they had the de-Christianization movement. They persecuted Christians and Catholics. They killed them. And they created a new system that did not trust in the ability of the common person to make their own decisions. They created a totalitarian system of government, which went on to be the basis of modern socialism. Now, I, I know you talk about a kind of similar phenomenon in your documentary, these, you know, looking at the world these days, where you do have these two kind of polar opposite systems in their more developed phase, where you have the, what is left, at least, of the American idea, this independence that is rooted in faith and belief and in, in, in personal integrity. And you have this other system that's rooted in this idea of totalitarian government, that we need big government, that we need these controls, and that people should be regulated in terms of what you believe, how you speak, and how you act. Uh, in terms of this situation and the climate you're making this video, I guess, why did you think it was needed to have this discussion right now? Well, I think that, that as we went along, I mean, we, that we, were, we were charged with making a, a movie about the how the country was founded and what it was based on. And what we realized in making it as we went along is that we were really making a movie about religious liberty because the difference in the American Revolution and the French Revolution is that the American Revolution was built on a bottom-up idea of government that, that the people had the power to elect the officials that they wanted to elect, but that we were a godly nation. We were a, a nation that respected the authority of a higher power than government. And in the French Revolution and in all socialist and communist revolutions, the government is the highest source of power. And that's why they have to be atheists. They have to remove any vestige of a belief in a higher power or as much as they can because they don't want to have any, any authority higher than the almighty state. And if you have a population that believes that their power comes from God and not the government, they can't be controlled. And so that's why our movie is about religious liberty and about what's going on now in America where you have de Blasio, Cuomo, threatening the synagogues in New York, that they will close them if they don't stop meeting. You have Gavin Newsom out here in California fining churches for opening. And basically this persecution of the religious is a staple of a leftist government that is built on human reason and not divine inspiration. Well, and you know, it's interesting, or well, terribly, terrible in a way, but interesting to observe, which is that you always see that. Anytime a socialist government has come into power, the first thing it does is persecutes religion. And it's hard to say that de Blasio and Newsom are doing this intentionally, but it, it seems to be a natural say, element of these systems taking power, that the first thing they try to do is destroy religion. And I think you hit on something interesting here, which I've talked about on the show as well, which is that America was built on the idea of recognizing a power higher than government. And when we're dealing with socialism, communism, government is the highest power. Now, one thing I've been told before and I've talked about on the show as well also is when you don't believe there's a power higher than government, government becomes the moral authority. So whatever it does under political correctness is what is moral. This is why genocides take place. This is why crimes against humanity take place. But when government is held by a higher standard, one that it cannot control, when people believe in a power higher than it, people have the basis of judging its actions by a different moral code that does not change. Now, I know you talk about in your film quite a bit of this actually, and you look at the history of it as well, how would you say this idea motivated some of the different chapters in the history of the United States? Well, I think that what we try to do in the film is, is, is sort of say, where, where did it start to change? I mean, we started as a government built on these principles and everybody was pretty much in agreement about it, you know, but where did it start to go wrong? And I think one of the things we talk about is that the institution of slavery, which they could not get rid of in the founding of the country, became a stain on the country that had to be corrected. And that was corrected. There, the mechanism to correct it was built into the Constitution because the people that designed the Constitution knew enough to know that that was a problematic, terrible institution, and it would have to be someday removed and done away with. So I think that that 
that that sort of stain has been something that the enemies of this country, the enemies of the idea of freedom, of individual liberty, have been able to use to try to turn people against the country, to say, you know, this country is built on slavery. You can say back to them, well, this country also fought a war to remove that institution because they knew that it was wrong. And America is the only government in the world that is a, a self-correcting government that the people can actually change rather than just having a dictator change its mind. So I think a lot of these things are, are you know, as this country has gone along, there have been a number of things that the left has been able to use to chip away at the idea that really what this country is based on is a, a faith in God and an individual liberty under that God, and that we answer to no higher power than God. And Nick Searcy, it's a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, it's Nick Searcy. I'm, I'm calling for Congresswoman Omar. I was making the film about God in America. Well, do you know when she'll be in? Well, is her brother there or her husband or whatever? The death of, of, uh, uh, of religion in America is the death of America as we know it. There has been an attack on churches, on the freedom of churches, on the ability of people even to go into churches. We are in danger of forgetting God and the consequences are disastrous. It's because the Bible is the printed word of God. It provides a lot of the spiritual foundation of our nation. Ten Commandments right there on the building. Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That proposition was radical. That said, folks, we're again broadcasting five days a week, Monday through Friday. And also Sundays, I do a live broadcast, live Q&A, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you want to support us also, please consider joining us on Patreon. You can find the link to that in the description below. If you haven't already also, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps this channel. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can tell a friend or family member about Crossroads. Now that said, folks, again, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.